Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to review Infamy Infamy. So Infamy Infamy is the new ancient skirmish game by Two Fat Lighties. It's following on in their chain of command and sharp practice style. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy of it. I have a digital copy of Infamy Infamy because uh, I do not want to wait whatever six months it is to get it shipped from the UK. So I bought a digital copy and I'm working on painting up my stuff in the moment. So there was no big rush, but uh, I wanted to get this video out today while I have time to record. So if you've never seen one of these before, the way they work is five things I like, three things that I sort of maybe would prefer changed, but don't necessarily dislike them, but maybe I'm not the biggest fan. And one thing that makes the game special or unique so you're not just playing another reskin of something else. It's, it's just the way I do things. So the first thing, literally the first thing that struck me when I started uh, looking through the Infamy Infamy book is that the forces have very different styles. If you're playing a Roman force, you have access to specifically Roman things, forming shield walls, um, maneuvers that, that trained drill troops can do. If you're playing a barbarian force, you have access to barbarian things, like getting a giant mob and just sort of rushing towards the enemy, um, or whipping your troops up into a frenzy, a uh, fervor, is the word they use, which gives them specific, uh, special bonuses, which if you have a fervid unit, you can counter some of the Roman bonuses, or the Romans can sort of form big shield walls and throw a bunch of javelins, and sort of knock back your fervor a little bit, so... Uh, it's 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 good to see that there are actually differences between playing a barbarian or playing a Roman. So many times you play these games and it's sort of like, well, the Roman benefit is that they just have better armor and a better morale save. But uh, but the guys at Two Fat Lighties decided that they really wanted to to get into the actual game itself and to and to really make you behave differently as a Roman commander, not just sort of roll differently. The second thing I really like about this is that they went to the effort to stipulate between where you're actually fighting. So if you're a Roman force operating in Roman territory, it's a lot easier for you. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't, well, maybe not easier, but it's a lot kinder for you. Uh, you have to rely less on scouts. If you know you're going to be fighting at home, you can maybe leave a few extra horse units. At, uh, you, know, you can take some more infantry instead of horses. Don't rely so much on scouts uh, since the enemy is going to get fewer ambush points. Um, you still should take some because there's still going to be some ambushes out there, but you don't have to break as many. So, for example, if you're playing through the Roman Civil War, well, I should be more specific, the the uh, Caesar v. Pompey, the Caesarian v. Pompeian Civil War, not the one that came after that or the one that came before that or the ones who came after that, anyway. Uh, Labinus being Caesar's 2IC, who should be more famous than he is. He's very good. Watch the uh, Historia Civilis does a great job in, in really promoting how good Libinus actually was. Anyway, um, if you're fighting in Spain, the, the two Roman armies are basically very similar, uh, and you're not going to have to worry too much about ambushes. Whereas if you're taking your units for the first time into, say, Britain, uh, if you're a big fan of the uh, Simon Scarrow novels, as I am, you can see uh, Macro and Cato fighting in Britain, getting ambushed all over the place, and we know from history that the Britons were very good at ambushes, as were the Germans. Uh, as, you know, <laughs> Varus and his legions will, will testify. Um, you, if you're fighting in barbarian territory, there's way more ambush points, way more opportunities to be ambushed. Um, I, I'm going to go on a limb and say, if you're fighting in barbarian territory as a Roman, you're going to get ambushed. <laughs> you're just going to get ambushed. Um, ambush points... Okay, so... I should, I should actually mention what ambush points are. In sharp practice, there's a, there's a rule called ambush, or ambuscade, or something like that where you can deploy a unit and fire it straight away. It's very effective to do this. It costs command cards, and you can do it from your deployment point. Uh, in Infamy Infamy, it's it's a similar sort of thing, but it's only from the ambush points. You can only ambush from certain ambush points, and you can sort of shut them down before the game starts, and you can, you can do all sorts of things with them. But uh, when there's six of them, as there are when you're playing in Roman t in, uh, in Barbarian Territory, you're going you're gonna to have to play much more defensively. You're going to have to do the whole sort of closing ranks a little bit, you might be more hesitant to rush forward, uh, which maybe isn't so great when you're playing the scenario where the Roman engineers are trapped in the middle and you have to get to them, that sort of thing. Number three, and I'm not just excited about this for Infamy Infamy, I want this to be in chain of command and sharp practice as well. I love this so much. The uh, Supra Numerum Leader, 
the free uh, the one point zero level leader. Okay, so <laughs> so what I really like about this is that sometimes you just have a unit that you don't really care about that much. So for example, you you have your Roman legionary force, and then you have like a unit of auxilia archers, just because archery is nice. You want to be able to duel enemy archers. Uh, you'd like to be able to snipe if the enemy wants to sit back a little bit, but you don't want to put too much effort and uh, expense into your archers. Or, for example, in sharp practice, you have maybe a unit or two of skirmishers that you're basically just going to use to screen your main force, and you don't really care about their commander, but you're forced to pay three points for a leader for them. Otherwise, you, you're in trouble. The super enumerum leader, I think that's how you say it, I'm going to forgive me for that, uh, is basically a level one, is a, is a one point level zero leader that you activate with with the with you know in the way you would normally activate a level zero leader in the sharp practice chain of command style games so the super enumerum leader which i'm i'm gonna mispronounce at some point uh is essentially just a cheap one point or free if it's included in the list leader who has basically command level zero and his job is to be a sort of guy you have around and then every so often when you want to activate that unit you go oh and you throw them a bone and then activate them. Instead of having to pay three points or six points to get a leader there, he can do things like take shock off. He's basically like attaching a minor leader to a to a, a, a bigger leader in a, in a game of sharp practice. So, for example, you have your level three commander commanding your formation, and then the level one just taking a point of shock off here or there. Or if the level three gets hit, he can take over. So, so the super numerum is something I'm very excited for, uh, and I hope it becomes a staple for the Lottie games. Now, before, rally points. Rally points are great. So, the way rally points work are, if you get defeated in combat, instead of just sort of moving backwards or you know, fleeing in a certain angle towards your board edge, you can, if you have a rally point nearby, you can actually just form up on the rally point and face whatever direction you want. Um, the Romans can do this. Certain Roman units can do this on other units. So, for example, um, if you have a, two Roman units here, one in front, one behind, and the one in front gets defeated in certain circumstances. Again, it's it, it's too much to go into here, but in certain circumstances, one unit can use the other as a rally point and sort of go up behind it or beside it or something like that. Uh, skirmishers can pretty much always use formed up infantry units as rally points, so they can just go back through them and appear on the back, or they can you know skirt around the side of them, and as skirmishers do. Uh, most barbarian noble cavalry will have some sort of uh, cavalry specific skirmish point, so they get driven back a little bit and they form up and charge again, or they form up and run completely the opposite direction and slingshot themselves. Um, sometimes rally points are laid to replenish your ammunition, we'll get to that later, but uh, I like the idea of having a rally point. Uh, I think too many times in these sort of rank and file games, or obviously it's not a rank and file game, but you know what I mean, like in games like that, um, we get too obsessed with, with degrees and unit facings and it's like, well the unit must move back this way. So, well, in, in real life, they didn't really do that. They sort of moved back and formed up. And yeah, we normally represent it with a morale test. But I like the, the idea of being able to retreat to a specific rally point, form up, and then have another go. I, I love that idea. Um, some, barbar some barbarians can use chariots as rally points. Uh, you can buy rally points, I believe. Um, yeah, that, that, there's so much, so much potential there. And I love that they've included it in the game. Also, you can make cool dioramas, which is always great. Number five, they included a campaign in the main rulebook, um, especially considering how cheap the main rulebook actually is. It's not that expensive. Uh, to have basically a fully-fledged campaign there is amazing. Uh, a campaign that plays differently for the Romans as it does to the barbarians. Uh, the way they've done it is very clever. They've set out the year, and they split the year into weeks. And they've gone that, okay, this is the campaign season. So these are the eight or nine months of the year where you can actually fight and roll a dice. And then, you know, that tells you how much time has passed before your first game. So the campaign begins in mid-March, but you might roll three weeks and have your first game in early April. Um, and then you might roll a week and have another game straight away. Or you might roll four weeks and have a whole month gap between your games. Um, you might have... You might be playing so many games in the year that your army gets so worn down by the end of it, you're you're basically destroyed, or you can only have a couple of couple of fights per year. So you can have maybe two or three campaigns going on at a club or at a gaming group, all at the same time. Um, but maybe they're progressing differently. Maybe one group is way ahead of everybody else, but they've you know 
month-wise, but they've had four games, but it's cost them three months, whereas another guy's poor guy is struggling through. He's had three games in, in three weeks, and uh, his force is not looking so good, so at the end of it all, he's going to have more battle experience, but you're going to have a more intact force, and it'd be good to see the victory points at the end of that. Um, I love the way they've done it. They've included uh, a retinue for your commander. They've included things like uh, Romans can have a standard, um, and they make it pretty clear that you know, this probably shouldn't have a standard in a... Uh, the game is the skirmish game, so it's century level. Um, maniple level, if you like. <laughs> so it probably shouldn't really... Eh, yeah, it might have a standard, but maybe you know, not a really important one. But you know, you can include it if your centurion gets enough um, credibility. You can have a tribune tag along for a couple of games. And if he dies during the first two games, you're in trouble and you get disgraced. If he lives... After a few games, he actually becomes quite a decent warrior, and he gives you some bonuses for your political stuff back home. Um, that's probably more oriented at the imperial period than the than the pre period, but it's, it's it still works. Uh, you could attract the attention of a uh, your legate, your legate above you. You could attract his attention. He's obviously not going to fight with you, but his family can maybe help you out with some things. A um, little bit more money, a little bit more influence, that sort of stuff. So I really like the way they've done that. It's uh, it's very good. And the Barbarian's not left out either. You can have Druids join you. Uh, you can have Soothsayers who sort of predict the future. You can have crazy Barbarian Warriors who just come in and kill everybody. Um, it's, it's a really fun way they've done the campaign and very natural. I like it. So on to the things I'm maybe not so fond of. Number one, ammunition. I'm not a fan of ammunition in games. Um, maybe something like tank ammunition I'm a fan of keeping track of to a degree I mean tanks carried what like 50 60 70 80 rounds maybe not that but you know it, it, uh, tank ammunition I can sort of understand but I don't like having to keep track of ammunition for my seven groups of Romans who all have two javelins per group and then I throw three here and one uh, two here and one there but then these two join together because some circumstance happens and now I've got two here and none there and I lose track, and then you pick the counters up because you use dice and you forget them, and now you have no idea who has any ammunition left or not. So, well, I don't. I actually quite like it for a for a game mechanic purpose, but um, personally, I'm not a big fan of having to keep track of ammunition. Uh, different units have different types of ammunition. Uh, archers and skirmishers generally have infinite ammunition, which is good. But uh, things like your legionary has two pilum or pila, um, and you can restock them in some circumstances, but as a general rule, as a general thing, I'd much prefer it was sort of like a uh, runners going back and forth replenishing the ammunition. Although I understand you do have to cap certain abilities. So maybe I would say you can only use the throw peeler ability twice, twice per game. And then you're limiting the ability, not the ammunition itself. So it's sort of, yeah, I don't know, maybe just a pet peeve of mine, but um, it's something I'm maybe not so fond of. Number two, the armor saves. Um, this one is a little different because I don't really know how to implement armor other than the way they've done it here But I'm still not a big fan of the armor save system. So essentially in close combat you you roll your dice They roll their attack dice you roll your defense dice, and then you roll your armor save. I'm not a fan of the armor save um, I don't like one person dice one person dice one person dice So now your enemy the way from your enemy's point of view They've got to get like a five or a six and then you've got to not get a five or a six So they've got to get Essentially a 5 or a 6 and then a 1, 2, 3, 4. And then they've got to get another 5 or a 6. So it's, it's, just, it's just so much rolling, uh, so much back and forth. So it, for the main reason is it requires your opponent to pay attention. And sometimes it's just nice to be able to roll one and then they roll one and then you get back to the game. Instead of, oh, let me check my armor, look at the book, oh, okay, roll. And then they forget to roll, they roll too many, something like that. <sighs> I'd prefer if the armor was included in the defense somehow. But again, I have no solution to this. It's just when I saw the armor save there, I went, mm, I'm not a big fan of that. But again, I, I have no solution to this. And uh, I'm still happy to use it. It's just something that caught my eye. Number three, and this one's basically, I scraped in the bottom, bottom of the barrel to find this one, is that there's limited forces in the main book. Um, you're essentially s sort of limited to uh, late Republican Romans, so the Caesarean Romans, and then, or Pompeian Romans, however you want to call it. Normally they're called Caesarian Romans, to the early Imperial Romans. So uh, the guys going into uh, early Germany, or well, the Caesarian Romans went anyway, the guys doing the sort of Teutoburg Forest type stuff, and the invasion of Britain being the most famous part of the early Romans, early Imperial Romans. 
and for the barbarians, you have the, the Britons, which are the Iceni and those sort of people. Uh, you have the Gauls to fight against Caesar, of course. Uh, you have Germans to fight against, well, Romans of all kinds. Um, and there are different types of Gauls. So you have the Helvetii, the Helvetii, who was, can take German allies because, of course, you know, the story of the Helvetii, Caesar was finding them up close to the border near Belgium. And they sort of had a little bit of German allies coming across and Caesar went up and down. Um, anyway, but Caesar was basically dealing with these Germans while these Helvetii were going on and, and, and stuff like that. So there are different flavors of barbarians. Uh, they all have their own sort of subgroups as well, which is nice, but they are quite limited. For example, there is no uh, Dacians, which I was looking forward to, but they'll be, I'm sure they'll be in a supplement somewhere. Uh, and when I say supplement, I mean like a free PDF on the Ladi website. Um, completely done by them professionally, not like something a fan throws together. That's why I said I scraped the bottom of the barrel, because there will be more forces. They will be properly done. They will be put out by the Ladi guys. Uh, they will be f probably free, I imagine. I'm almost certain they'll be free. Everything else is. Um, and I'm not worried about them not doing it, because for Chain of Command, they've done Ethiopians. So if they're going to do Ethiopians for Chain of Command, that whole sort of conflict there, uh, I'm sure they're going to get to Dacians for, for Infamy, Infamy, and I'm sure they're going to get to uh, Hannibal and Scipio at some point. So, onto the thing that I really stood out for me is quite unique for this one. Um, normally, I would say something like the Lardy thing of the shock and everything like that, but if you see my other Two Fat Lardy's reviews, you'll, you'll know that's sort of a given. Um, I like the Signa cards. So, the Signa cards, which I'm going to repeatedly call Signum cards, it's just because I'm going to confuse that. But the Signa cards are so great. Uh, they're, they're the cards you use to activate your, your abilities. So uh, the Romans, I think, are the only ones having them so far. So well, they're most prominent for the Romans, anyway. So you have six. And uh, putting a shield wall up costs one or two. So you have, your, you, you have your six in your hand at the start of the game. And this is the genius of it. Say you have your unit there you want to put in shield walls, so you pay two. Those two aren't discarded. They're put in the discard pile and shuffled back into the deck. So if they come back, you have four permanent cards here and two floating in the deck. When you pay, play the other four, they also go back into the deck. So say you've played three cards so far in the game and one gets dealt from the deck. You pick him up, he's temporary, play him, goes back in. So it's sort of like a you have a, I don't know how well I describe that, but you basically have like a big pool at the start that constantly comes back to you, but in a way that you can't predict. So you have a certain amount of tactical flexibility I have the cards that are a seal wrap up there. I haven't used them yet. So I didn't want to get them out for this. Um, you have like a fixed level of tactical flexibility at the start of the game. A, a pretty huge level. And as you use your your tactics, as the battle gets on and gets a little bit more chaotic, you have less and less um, control over how you use those abilities, although they're still fully effective, which I love. Uh, so many times it's like a dice roll and, and it just gets harder and harder or the abilities get lesser and lesser. I love the randomness and the chaos of this. It's it's perfect. Um, so much stuff in Infamy, Infamy are things that I'm going to use when I redo my Colonial Shut Practice unofficial thingy. Um, the ambush points I love, but this Signum card thing, this see, I did it. I told you I'd do it. Signa card thing um, is so good. You have this this well disciplined force coming to the battle, and they don't become less disciplined, but they become less able to enhance that discipline. They become less able to. You have this well-disciplined force come to the battle, and it's fully prepared and it's fully ready. It's rested, it's well-fed, or something, you know, it's good as you can be um, at the start of the battle. But as it goes on, they don't get less discipline, but they get less well well used. They get less commanded. They don't forget how to form shield walls, but maybe the the commander's just not paying attention at the right time. The chaos has, has got it, or maybe he's just as good as he was at the start temporarily, and then the next time he sort of loses it a little bit. I love the chaos of that. I love the I love the inclusion of this mechanic. Whoever came up with that is frankly genius. I love that. Uh, it may not be. I'm almost certain it's not specific to this, but I love that they've done that with the Signa cards. The, the having the pool that that replenishes, but but in a chaotic way, it's just fantastic. So that's my review of Infamy. Infamy. Uh, I haven't had a game of it yet. I do hope to have a game soon. I have a lot of painting to do. Uh, unfortunately, the downside of having you know. I got my Romans, they're pretty much done, but the Barbarians are going to take a lot longer. Um, the downside of having giant mobs, which is, you know, that's all fun on the tabletop, though. So, let me know what you thought of the review, and if you have anything else you want me to review, pop it down in the comments below. 
Um, let me know if you've had a game of Infamy Infamy or you've looked at the rulebook and you have any things of your own. And if you want me to review anything else, just let me know and I'll see what I can do. Thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day.